Okay, well, I, I was saying good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, first talk of 2023. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, extinction crisis, uh, endangered animals in the zoology museum collections. So what so this, this is a, a kind of an intervention rather than a, a redisplay in the zoology museum. Um, so meaning that instead of changing the cases, the specimens, the objects, the labeling um, inside the cases, all that we've done is put some new sticky labels on the outside of the cases in order to highlight a, a story. I, and this intervention was inspired by the 2022 United Nations Biodiversity Conference, which uh, some of you may know more familiarly as COP15. Although unfortunately it happened at the same time as the World Cup. So it really sort of kind of fell off the radar for many people. Um, anyway, I'll go more into that later. So the first question I had was which specimens in the museum are threatened? Um, so I spent a, a while, a few months, going through all the specimens on display and then looking to see sort of what state they were currently in um, out there in the wild. Uh, and then the thought was how to share that information. So this is when the, the intervention idea took root. So going back to how we worked out what's threatened, uh, what I did was use the IUCN Red List. This is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Red List of Threatened Species, to give it its full title. Uh, this was established in 1964, and since then, uh, they've assessed over 150,000 species um, to look at their, their current state. Of these, almost a, a quarter, uh, 42,100, face some level of threat from being critically endangered to just near threatened. Uh, and what the list is used for is to help guide conservation efforts on behalf of, on the part of governments, NGOs, universities, whoever's involved in conservation work can refer to the Red List, which is all open and accessible to anyone with an internet link, um, and they can find out current uh, details about all sorts of species. All right. So the Red List categories are uh, broken down into several categories you can see here. Uh, extinct, that's quite obvious what it is. Extinct in the wild is animals only still existing in, in captivity, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, least concern. And then two that are sort of required because of the lack of knowledge. We've got not evaluated and data deficient. I'll go into more details on those through the talk. So after going through all the museum specimens, this is not including the insects at this time. Um, this is kind of the breakdown of where they all sat in the different categories. Uh, so you can see I've got a, all the different categories uh, the number of specimens that are on display in the museum and then the number of species that they uh, represent because quite often we'll have several specimens of the same species. So for extinct, uh, we've just got the one. Um, critically endangered, we've got 12. Endangered, 23 um, species. Vulnerable, 32. Near threatened, 17. So fairly similar numbers to those last few categories. And then least concern is the biggest category, 201. Uh, data deficient, we've just got two. Not evaluated, 59. Uh, long extinct, so this you know, covers the things like our fossil specimens uh, or models of extinct fossil fish or ar archaeopteryx fossils and so on. Uh, then we've also got quite a large number of specimens that have not actually been fully identified species. Uh, this is a, a kind of a long ongoing project that I'll be working on, but it's fairly common in I'd say in quite a few museums to not everything, you don't know the full details of where it came from, so sometimes and you don't also have the full specimen, so sometimes identifying to exact species can be tricky. And then we've also got a couple of domestic animals. Uh, so for totals of 538 specimens on display, not including insects, uh, with 366 species represented. So looking at what's actually causing these threats, uh, these days sort of the IUCN uh, define them as extinction drivers. Uh, and although there's a broad range of threats, uh, they've generally been categorized down into these five uh, major groups. So you've got changes in land and sea use, exploitation, resources, climate change, pollution, and invasive species. So just go into a bit more detail. Number one, changes in land and sea use. That's the big problem of habitat loss or poor management of habitat. Uh, that's increasing agricultural use of spaces. Um, even things like construction of dams can cause major changes to everything from migration routes to uh, the habitat that was once occupied by certain species. But it also includes things like increased uh, shipping lanes, you know, changes in shipping lanes or increased numbers of ships going around can affect uh, species such as whales. So there's lots of ways that land and sea use is altering. Uh, next one, direct exploitation of natural resources. Uh, this is the straightforward things like chopping down a forest, logging, um, fishing, hunting, whether it's a, a sort of low level sustainable hunting or higher, more organized level. 
but also includes things like extraction of fossil fuels and the knock-on effect that mining can have, uh, and water extraction too, which is obviously a big problem in many places around the world. Climate change is the, the huge one as well, um, and it has many different effects, whether it's increasing temperatures, uh, but also more unpredictable weather, resulting in floods. Uh, you've got lots of pack ice, lots of um, sea ice and glaciers all over the world. Uh, and it results in wetter or drier habitats, which can be detrimental to the, the species that evolved in those places. And then we've got pollution. Uh, this covers everything from pesticides and herbicide use on big scale and small scale. I, major plastic pollution, plastic particles everywhere now from mountaintops to deepest sea trenches. Um, sewage, untreated sewage is a big problem, light pollution. There are many other forms of pollution as well, but these are some of the highlights. Light pollution being a particular problem, say, for, for insects and, and birds as well. And then we've got the last one, category five, invasive species. Uh, so this is one of the results of human movement around the world as we've introduced both on purpose and accidentally uh, species to other places. And often they can outcompete native species or even just end up predating on these native species, but they also carry diseases which uh, species are, native species are not always uh, immune to. So lots of problems there. So to bring you back to the actual display, um, what we did is quite simple one, it's just two graphic panels, um, 100 large labels, and then 10 small insect labels. And these are all just sort of scattered around the museum. So it's almost like uh, you have to seek them out for yourself. Um, and I'm just gonna go through some of the labels and some of the specimens we have, just to give you a taste of, of what's out there. So starting with the extinct category, uh, we have the classic one, we have the dodo. Um, this is the typical label here. All these labels are about the size of a credit card and they're just stuck on the outside of the cases or nearest where the specimens are in the museum. Um, our dodo specimen consists of a cast of the head uh, of the dodo, it's a famous museum one, but we also have some real bones um, from actually from two individuals, because the leg bones and the toe bones there aren't from the same specimen. They were added together for display purposes. And you can see the year in the label, you've got the extinction driver two and five, showing that it was kind of direct exploitation. So the others were hunted. Um, and also the invasive species, uh, which caused probably more major cause of the disappearance of the dodo as pigs and rats and dogs were introduced to their island home. All right, next level, critically endangered. I example here, hawksbill turtle. We've actually got three hawksbill turtle specimens, an adult, a hatchling, and a, a subadult. And critically endangered is sort of generally described as defined as a species facing an extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. And what the sort of IUCN Red List does is have certain uh, levels that, thresholds that a species have to cross before they're put into a certain category. And the one for being critically endangered, one of the, the thresholds is an 80% reduction or more in population size over the last three generations. And that's what's happened with hawkbill turtle. Some of the other critically endangered specimens on display, we have a Tristan albatross skull. Uh, this is, a, depending on who you look, talk to, either a subspecies or very closely related to the wandering albatross, but it's got a very small home range uh, and it's threatened by um, invasive species on this island where it nests, uh, but also accidental bycatch in the fishing industry. Uh, we've also got another bird, the great Indian bustard. This is not actually in the museum. This is upstairs in the first floor of the Graham Kerr building. Many of you who work in the building will have walked past it many a time, maybe never realizing its significance. It's also a prize winning piece of taxidermy. Um, so do have a, a look next time you're in the building. Um, next, we've also got Bornean orangutan skeleton. Uh, this is in the main museum, but if you're in looking for it, it's a little bit of a tricky one to find because it's around the back of the primate's case that almost looks like a space that you shouldn't go. So do stick it out. And then we've got small tooth sawfish. Um, sawfish are a very endangered group of uh, fish. The rostrum there, you can see, has long been a very popular collector's item. Um, but that combined with overfishing, uh, pollution in their in, um, spawning areas uh, and climate change have all resulted in major problems for the sawfish. Next level down is endangered. Uh, this is basically when a species is very likely to become extinct in their near known native ranges in the near future. An example I pulled out for this one is the Australian lungfish. Uh, this has been experienced a decline in the area of occupancy. It only comes a quite small area in Eastern Australia. Uh, and the quality of the species habitats has um, declined due to fragmentation. Uh, this is one of the problems, dams and so on, uh, causing problems in the watercourse. 
And you see there the endangered, it's a nice orange color. More endangered species include Indian narrow-headed softshell turtle, just a skull for that one. Uh, Eastern coal, uh, a very cute little carnivore, um, marsupial carnivore, which is unfortunately experiencing problems with invasive species, things like cats and foxes that were introduced to Australia and Tasmania have caused uh, major declines in the coal. Um, and then a rather unusual one, uh, the Seychelles giant millipede. Perhaps not surprisingly, there's not many millipedes, um, hardly any included on the IUCN list. And that's a, a, an issue I'll come into later. Many invertebrates have not been assessed yet. Um, but this one has, uh, and unfortunately it's at endangered level. And then on to the short fin mako shark, um, endangered as well. And again, it's something that is not just the short fin mako, but many shark species are showing major declines in populations and at our various levels of threat. In fact, out of all the cases in the museum, uh, the one that contains the sharks and sawfish uh, and various other chondrixes fish has the most labels on it. I'll, I'll show you that later. Next level down is vulnerable. Um, this one, I picked out the Arabian oryx. Uh, so this one is uh, vulnerable described as threatened with extinction unless the circumstances that are threatening its survival and reproduction improve. And the Arabian oryx is actually, it's a good news story. This is one of the major conservation successes of the last few decades. Uh, they were actually got to a stage of being extinct in the wild in the early 70s. But then through various uh, programs run by the Phoenix Zoo and Fauna and Flora International, uh, they were bred in captivity and have been released now to various places in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and they've actually just been downgraded several times and they're now at vulnerable level, uh, last graded in 2011. So it's actually a moving in the right direction with this species. Other vulnerable species include the Atlantic horseshoe crab. Uh, this is a rather interesting one. One of its major threats has been overcollected uh, so that its blood can be used in pharmaceutical industry uh, and in scientific testing because it's got very unique blood for um, species that provides all sorts of interesting qualities. Uh, next, we've also got the coconut crab, no relation to the horseshoe crab, quite distance apart evolutionary. Um, but the coconut crab, although it has a very wide distribution across the Indo-Pacific um, area uh, is threatened by being overhunted for cons human consumption. It's also threatened by invasive species. Although it's the biggest um, land arthropod there is, uh, it's actually threatened in some places by introduced yellow crazy ants, which swarm over the, um, the young and the, the older coconut crabs and can end up killing them. Uh, another island species, the southern brown kiwi, um, its major threat was, or still is, introduced uh, predators, in particular the stoat, which preys on uh, eggs and young of the kiwi. Um, and then another one, ground pangolin. I, unfortunately, another group of organisms, the pangolin is very heavily threatened um, because of overcollection uh, and hunting, in particular to get their scales for use in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, so that's definitely one group that uh, is a, and a major threat. We recently had a researcher come in and sample some of our pangolin scales. So there, these museum specimens are still being of use in conservation work even though they're long dead. And next level down, near threatened. Um, this one we've got medicinal leech uh, as an example. This is a, a species that may be vulnerable to endangerment in the near future. Although medicinal leeches were once found throughout Europe, um, they, their preferred habitat, freshwater ponds, have been showing declines. And also the species that they feed on, so large wild mammals, um, have also been disappearing. So uh, it's although it's hard to maybe survey well for medicinal leeches, you could extrapolate that if their favorite habitat is disappearing, then they will be under threat as well. Other near threatened species include Indian python, uh, one that's been over collected for things like pet trade, but also uh, just over harvested for, for bushmeat. Um, lumpsucker, uh, a European fish, it's um, kind of been taking the place of endangered sturgeon. Uh, so although people used to get, or still do get caviar from sturgeon, they're also looking for caviar and roe from other species, and the lump sucker um, does provide quite large amounts. The platypus is one of the, I think, the only species we've got here that ticks all five boxes for extinction drivers. Um, but despite that, it's actually in a fairly good state. Part of the reason being that uh, its uniqueness as a, um, as a mammal, as a marsupial, as an, as an organism, has uh, certainly created lots of conservation interest. Uh, and so though there are various threats facing it, it's um, been very well monitored throughout its range. And then another group, blue nat nat parrot, uh, being an example of, um, unfortunately, parrots and lots of other exotic, fancy-looking birds like it, threatened by overcollecting for the pet trade. 
um, and also with major loss of habitat, tropical rainforest being a, a key area. And then there's the final category, least concern. Um, this is uh, showing when not being a focus of species conservation because the specific species are still plentiful in the wild, this definition. Um, now, a bit of a strange, uh, perhaps surprising, including here of the Atlantic bluefin tuna. Many people may have expected it to be one that's under some sort of threat. Um, but this is when it gets interesting with the IUCN red list, as that globally, the bluefin tuna is least concerned. But when you start to break down where it's actually found and look at particular populations, it's actually got different levels. So the population found in the Gulf of Mexico is listed as endangered, and the populations in Europe, Mediterranean Sea, and so on, are near threatened. So this is one thing the Red List does as well, is change the categories based on the individual populations, which is important to have that differentiation. Another least concerned ones, we've got the channel bill toucan, I, again, something that's facing habitat loss problems, but still very plentiful. The Gouldian finch, uh, another very pretty bird, lots of different potential threats, but still quite high numbers. And then another odd one to finish off, the tuatara, um, little very odd reptile from New Zealand, which although faced major problems from invasive species, I, so mammalian predators wiping it out, um, again, because of conservation work done, it is now seemingly secure on several offshore islands in New Zealand. I, and there are hopes and attempts, I think, to basically eradicate uh, the introduced predators from more islands and hopefully reintroduce the tuatara to more, more different places to bolster the population. And then we get onto the largest category. Perhaps not surprisingly, this is not evaluated. Uh, an example here being the spiny starfish. Um, and just being not evaluated does not indicate that a species is not at risk of extinction, but simply the species has not yet been studied for any risk to be quantified and published. So it's a kind of a, an unknown. We don't know how much, how many species, how many specimens there are out there, many of uh, particular invertebrates and particular marine creatures. Other examples uh, here, we've got a uh, common green bird wing butterfly. I am one of the only insects that have included in this display. Now at the species level, it's at least concern, but the subspecies that we have on display here, Herbalanus, I, that's not been studied further. And so it's only found on a few islands um, and the exact status of the subspecies is unknown. And this is again, something that requires further work for many different organisms, differentiating out from the wider species to the, to the subspecies. Uh, another interesting one, not evaluated, is a chambered nautilus. Um, this uh, ancient cephalopod, ancient mollusk, um, is listed on CITES, which is the, the uh, Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species, because it's very popular in the shell trade and craft trade, um, and the beautiful shells have long been um, bought and purchased and sold around the world. Uh, but surprisingly, it's not actually included in the IUCN red list. It's got quite a wide distribution in the Pacific, um, but trying to gauge exact numbers is hard. Another marine one that had same similar problem, Neptune's cup sponge. This is actually a, quite an interesting one because it was thought to be extinct. Uh, the first specimens were found around Singapore and they were very popular as curios, as collector's items for museums and individuals. Uh, and after a few decades, they disappeared from the waters and it was thought there were no more. Um, but then in the 1970s, whole range of other um, populations were found uh, off the north coast of Australia and other islands around sort of Papua New Guinea area. Uh, and so it's, it kind of, it's a Lazarus species. It came back from the dead, as it were. But despite that, it's still not been fully evaluated by the IUCN. Um, another one that's maybe a bit of a surprise, the Japanese giant spider crab. Uh, it's the biggest um, arthropod there is uh, and only comes from quite a small area off sort of, I think, southern coast of Japan, but it's still not been evaluated. It's potentially threatened to some degree by overfishing, but there are um, controls in place. But again, it's just another example where more research, more information is required. And then one to bring back home to the zoology building and the Graham Kerr in particular, after whom the building's named, the South American lungfish. Graham Kerr, some of you may know, uh, did a lot of his early work in the early 1900s on lungfish, and he might be a bit disappointed, possibly turning over in his grave to know that they've not been properly evaluated um, as to their status. So if that's uh, any students are wanting to get inspiration from Graham Kerr um, and go and study lungfish, then it'd be good to know quite how many there are left. Then we've got one final category, data deficient. So this is kind of a um, known unknowns. 
uh, to use that phrase, as insuff insufficient information for a proper assessment of conservation status. Um, and it's a bit of a problem for certain species, things like the pink fairy armadillo. It's a, a small um, underground living uh, armadillo, so quite hard to survey for. You know, they're all going to be coming out potentially at night, but you know, it's a, a very hard one to find. Um, and there's a problem with this category, uh, the lack of records may indicate a dangerous, dangerously low abundance or a naturally low abundance. So care is required to differentiate between the two. Another example is the elegant cuttlefish. And this is one of our Blaschka glass model specimens. Um, but yeah, again, as marine species, sometimes very hard to get a gauge of exact numbers. Right, so done all this, we've got the um, display just installed this morning. And uh, so the next stage of sort of you know, what outreach have we done? Are we going to do? Um, so I've done a bit already with schools, social media, and we're developing a museum tour app. So before we got the um, display installed, before we had the, the actual stickers, I did have a bit of prototype testing with a, a school group that came in, and I had some made up labels myself, showing the different categories, stuck around the museum, and I got school kids to come in and run around the museum in a controlled fashion to find uh, a particular species they're interested in that had one of these categories, bring it back, and they would talk about the different extinction drivers that were uh, causing threats to that organism. And they seemed to like it. They sort of went away all happy afterwards. So that was quite a, a fun bit of work for me that helped develop uh, the rest of the display. We've also been highlighting on social media this week um, some of the, the species on display. I picked seven specimens um, ranging from extinct to not evaluated to show the diversity of what we have. Um, and then I tried to make sure that when the social media post went out, it was a picture of the organism in the museum, sort of the stuck preserved animal, but also of a photo of the animal in the wild. And I used a Creative Commons, Commons um, license-free photos from iNaturalist for this purpose. And I was quite pleased to see that there were photos of all organisms, organisms required. Uh, another one we're working on is a Bloomberg Connect app. So this is uh, an app by Bloomberg that's used by museums all over the world. And it allows people to I basically self-conduct a tour. You can walk around with your smartphone, scan QR codes, uh, and then that allows you to find further information about certain specimens, uh, whether it's a, a talk, uh, an actual audio file by the curator or staff member, or whether it's more photos or more, more written information. And so we picked 10 specimens to develop for this tour uh, from a wide taxonomical and geographic range to examples there, a sterlet um, type of sturgeon from Europe and an emperor penguin from Antarctica. Uh, and in the displays in the museum, they've got a slightly different label, which includes the number um, that you type into your phone to get the further information. And swinging all the way back around to COP15, the original inspiration for this display, I, some of you may have been aware that a resolution was reached and the vision created by the COP15 meeting was that by 2050, biodiversity is valued, conserved, restored, and wisely used, maintaining ecosystem services, sustaining a healthy planet, and delivering benefits essential for all people. Uh, one of the initiatives is this is the 30 by 30, the idea or the hope that uh, protects 30% of, of wild habitat by 2030 on stepping stones to 2050. However, you may be pessimistic. Some people certainly are. I, a previous similar target between 2010 and 2020, the IT biodiversity targets, there are 20 targets to look at improving biodiversity. None of them were met in 10 years. However, I prefer to try and be optimistic. Optimistic, uh, Biodiversity awareness has increased, uh, I would say, to a higher level than ever at the moment. Um, and although we've got the knowledge, we've got, we know what we need to do, um, what we need to do now is have the courage to do it and determination required to push through the changes needed to save our biodiversity, save the planet, as it were. So next steps, um, what we're gonna do locally uh, in the museum is continue assessing the specimens we have, ones in stores in particular. I'd like to know more about um, what we have, particularly the, the higher level, the critically endangered, endangered species we have. I, I conduct further tours and encourage more school visits to help spread the word. Um, we've also got a bit more protein too for the insect specimens. My fellow curator, Jan Robinson, the entomology curator, I, has been focusing on those. So there'll be more information to come about them. Hopefully she could be, uh, I'm keen to give a talk about the insect side, and that will also highlight more of the, the British um, conservation categories, which follow IUCN levels in some ways and slightly different in other ways. So more to hear about that later. So generally just want to spread the knowledge and encourage further, encourage further research using the specimens we have. 
uh, ultimately with the end person um, end purpose of helping to turn more of those red signs as critically endangered into greens as a least concern. That's our aim over the years to come. Right. Okay. So here we are in the museum. And what I want to show you is the actual specimens, the labels in situ. So there's really all it is, just stickers on the outside related to the cases. And then we've got our big new graphic panels. I, and you see here, some of the cases got more than others. Unfortunately, things like the primate cases have got lots of um, endangered species in them. Uh, and I'll show you the hidden gorilla skeleton around the back. So yeah, so many of you might not be aware of this one. So that's just a little taste of what we have on display. Um, so you have to come down yourself to the Zoology Museum and see if you can find some of the almost 100 species that have been highlighted.